I won't share it. All right. Well, it good. won't be a public, you know, uh, it was a private or something, right? But it won't be public. Well, do you uh, do you want to share that agenda or something so that I can stay on pace with you? Because uh, I sure. can't see it right now, and you can't. There should be another window. Oh. Again. I, I think you stopped. You stopped your... stop sharing at some point. What? You stopped sharing your oh, slides. I did not mean to. It must have been when I turned on the recording. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So let me, let me also. Just... There we go. All right. Well, first, let me, uh, since not everybody's familiar, let me, let me do something that I do as a uh, consultant on a regular basis and start with introductions for everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie Simmons. I go by Tank on the Auto Hot Key Forum. Uh, I have been doing automation for the better part of eight years, uh, primarily with Bank of America. Uh, and then recently I, I joined this, uh, this firm to, uh, uh, that does RPA as a, a business model. Uh, I was unaware that there had been a business model that developed around this. Uh, as probably many of you are uh, unaware, uh, and it is a global business. Uh, every major economic center in the world, uh, quite literally, uh, and it is a, a booming market. There is literally not a single firm that can hire RPA consultants fast enough. Uh, and I'm talking about big names like Accenture and Genpak. Uh, in, in a, in addition to this, uh, Genpak recently, uh, I found out is literally overbooked uh, and just literally do not have the bodies to do the, to do the work. Uh, RPA in general is just a, a new fancy uh, catch phrase to to say uh, desktop automation. Uh, now there are some uh, fancier tools to use. For these, uh, some of you may be aware, UiPath, uh, which is what started the conversation between Joe and I. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, WorkFusion, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism. These are, these are the kind of the big names in, in the so-called automation. There's, there's also a field called Cognitive Automation. Uh, most of you are familiar with Cognitive Automation, but maybe now don't know it. Uh, we're talking about things like Google Assistant and Alexa. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, some other things that may, uh, where you can train a robot uh, to do some semi-intelligent work and uh, pull, say, account numbers off of PDFs where things may not be in static locations and, and uh, they have to interpret the data in order to get what they need. Uh, so there's a, a training process with cognitive automation. And then there's AI, which is not, not ready yet. It, it is expensive. Uh, there is some AI with things like Watson, uh, but, but it is expensive and it is just not ready for general use. Uh, it just isn't. Uh, these, are, these are commonly accepted in, in, as, as true statements in this industry. Uh, now, that being said, I wish AutoHotKey was known as uh, RPA software. Uh, one of the things that probably differentiates it is the fact that there's not a... Uh, friendly GUI, although one might say pullovers macro creator is a, uh, a, a, a first step towards what you would look for in a, a RPA software, something that a business user, a, a uh, non-programmer could use to develop macros. Uh, so, so that's me. That's, that's, uh, that's my area. That's, that's, uh, that's what I'm, I'm into. Um, uh, the, I guess we should go around the room and, and kind of get everybody real quick. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start. So I'm, I'm Joe Glines, which I'm, everybody here knows me because I'm, I'm the common thread, but I, I'm not a programmer. Everyone knows that too, because I suck, but at least I know I suck, right? So I, I you know, um, I know my limitations, which I think is an important thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I want you guys go ahead. 
Hi, I'm Jean, Jean Lalonde from Montreal. Uh, I'm not a programmer, but I do programming for 20, 30 years, maybe. So as a hobby mainly, but a serious hobby. So I started with uh, basic on a, a Timex little computer and uh, uh, Pascal Modula 2 um, and a lot of things. So I, I do also VBA. Uh, but uh, my work was more uh, on the management side, so project management, uh, business analyst, things like that. I'm actually between two jobs, and I'm not looking for the second one for right now. So I'm a kind of a six-month break, which is a very comfortable situation that could extend to nine or 12. <laughs> but I I'm taking this time to look at different ways of doing work. And uh, first, excuse my English. I am I, my, French is my first language, so sometime I'll I'll take some uh, um, detour to to say what I want to say. But um, so um, talking with with Joe, we just uh, we were talking about uh, how to maybe use our skills, our knowledge, uh, into a, a, a different kind of mandate instead of just finding a standard job. So that's what we are looking at. I'm looking at. Um, I'm oh. Jim. And I've uh, been working as an IT developer and consultant for a long, long time. Uh, background in a number of different technology, uh, development technologies and database systems. Uh, but stumbled into AHK a while ago and began to realize how it could help um, with exactly what Tank has been talking about here tonight. Um, and was completely unaware of the market, emerging market for this kind of software. And so I'm fascinated to get as much information, Tank, as I can from you this evening about uh, just what you're seeing uh, out there and, and how you're dealing with it. Uh, I guess I'm Chad Wilson, um, maestroth on the forums. Um, biggest thing I've ever done is wrote uh, Auto Hotkey Studio. And um, I just like solving problems, and it, it just makes me happy every time I can see someone struggling and say, hey, why don't you use Auto Hotkey and show them how wonderful it is. And usually end up getting new people into the into the hobby and everything but uh yeah this is the first language i ever learned and they, aside from like uh maybe three or four lines in basic on like the commodore 64 but uh yeah i just love the software and would love to you know, be a part of anything going forward excellent well, uh, so let me uh, let me break away from the, the agenda here, and I want to talk a little bit about the role of uh, programming knowledge and uh, RPA. So it's it's designed for business users, but the reality is is uh, while any business user should be able to use RPA software, the reality is is you need that kind of thinking that you get from, from writing code, which is how to break things into statements. Uh, as a process. So whether you're a professional programmer or not, doesn't really matter so much as your ability to think like one. And, uh, and so it doesn't really matter what languages you, you know, either it's, it's that ability to, I have as well, quite a bit of uh, development experience. Uh, so, and it helps, it really does. Typical industries where you see a demand uh, let's before we get into typical industries, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about why people automate anything. And so the, the business pitch is never, ever, under any circumstances, automation. Okay, uh, you do not go to the business for the business with the pitch of we're going to automate stuff. Uh, we go to the business with uh, the pitch of uh, you have a lot of mundane processes that are rules based uh, which means they, they can in fact the, the whole process can be broken down into if then else statements uh, you have a lot of processes that require taking data from one system and putting it into another uh, 
So when we talk about industries, we have to think about where, where these apply. Uh, you have a lot of business processes where uh, the, the skill level required is not necessarily very great, okay? Uh, and, and so those, those are things that you wanna think about before you go and start talking about industries. Uh, a typical industry that sees the most action is uh, both insurance and banking. Uh, both see the most action in this area. Uh, we're starting to dabble with municipalities. So it's not um, it's not mom and pop businesses. These are, these are big companies that have a lot of money to spend. Okay, uh, the average cost to put it to a, a consultant in your building. Uh, the, this is just to give you a, an overview of what's what these companies expect to pay. Right, they expect to pay two thousand dollars a day plus expenses uh, or more for a consultant to be in the building and learning their processes and writing an, an automation solution. Uh, uh, that is an expectation that is uh, pretty much across the board. Uh, some of them go as much as $3,000 a day. Uh, so size of company is, is uh, this is not a cheap process. Uh, you should not expect to do it cheaply because it is a, uh, you, you have to live with a company. You, you, uh, you're going to spend three or four months on an engagement and um, you're going to be there every day. You're, you're going to, uh, you're going to travel a lot when you do this kind of work. Uh, and, uh, and you're going to have to deal with uncomfortable situations like employees who say, am I going to lose my job? And they're going to ask you because no. they're not going to ask their manager. Okay. So these are the kinds of things that you have to be prepared for. Uh, the, so when you, you pitch it, you say, look, we can save you a bunch of money. Return on investment, we primarily talk about the, the obvious return on investment, which is uh, staff reduction and uh, error reduction. Uh, so you, you talk about things like uh, if you've got 10 people uh, taking data from this one system and literally keying it into two other systems, that can be automated completely, right? That's that's easy. That's that's something all of us have have done on, on some level. Uh, if you are taking data from spreadsheets and entering it into multiple systems, and this is super commonplace, you would not believe how commonplace it is. Uh, and companies spend literally millions of dollars on staffing uh, for for people who just do this kind of work. So. Uh, it is, it is super low skill, it is super common, uh, and it is a super obvious win for them. Uh, more complicated things might be uh, uh, in the realm of, of things like that, you might see uh, processing invoices that may have a somewhat standard format and, and you can pick out the data that you need. Uh, but typically, it's it's what we call swivel chair and um, uh, just data entry from spreadsheets. That, that's where you're going to see the most uh, most bang for your buck, uh, and that's what you're selling. You're saying, "Look, I can I can take these processes that you have that are mundane, uh, and I can take the people out of the equation." Okay, uh, we're not talking about technology yet. But we're not. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, auto hotkey versus auto it versus uh, automation anywhere versus we're not, that never comes into the conversation when you're at that stage of, the, of it. Uh, when they hear, I can take 10 people off the board, all right, you figure, you figure the average cost for an associate making 15 bucks an hour, okay, cost them with insurance and, and benefits, you're, you're, they're going to spend Eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year, and and in cube space, all right. Just just the cube farm itself costs money for them. So we're going to take those players off the board, right? They can stack all these computers up that are doing this work in a in a single cubicle if they really wanted to. Uh, and I have done that, <laughs> um, incidentally. So now they're going to say, well, 
some people are a little queasy about eliminating people. You're, you've got, if you're going to take 10 people off the board, chances are in a company this size, you've got 10 open spaces somewhere else. Uh, repurpose them. Uh, I, I wrote a paper on that, uh, that that someone may, somebody may have seen, but uh, it, it's, you're, you're better, you're better off to recommend repurposing people than, than letting them go. Uh, so, the, so the save is, the big part of the save, the, the big part of the win is uh, taking players off the board that they're spending money on now to do mundane jobs that they don't need to. The average cost for a robot in this industry to do a single process is about $10,000. $10,000 versus 80 is a pretty, pretty easy choice for most organizations. Um, and that is where you do the convincing. Okay. Uh, cannot stress that enough. Uh, can, can, can you so, talk, talk go, a bit go ahead. about who the uh, people would be that you'd be talking to? Do the, what? The, the people that you're having that conversation with. These are executives. These are, you're, you're, you're starting with an executive level uh, proposal at this stage. Uh, you're trying to get executive sponsorship or a proof of concept at this stage. You're, you're looking for that. Uh, let's do one yeah. so we can show you what's possible and prove that, prove it out for you. Uh, you're looking for a, a statement of work for one, for one process uh, as a proving ground. Uh, and, and so your sale is on, I can reduce bodies for you. All right. I can reduce the number of errors because computers will type this data that's provided exactly how it's provided to it. Uh, whereas a human being may, may make copy paste errors, may make typing errors. Uh, so we're going to reduce error rate. Uh, so, so these are, these are our, our, our presentments for it. this. And this is where we see the size of the company matters. This is where we see the typical industries matter because this is where we see the most of this kind of situation uh, in today's world, uh, insurance and banking. Uh, we're, we're also doing a lot in uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, but it's not as uh, it's not as big a footprint. But uh, there there seems to be a lot of, of work there as well. Uh, so so let's say you get through that proof of concept presentation and, and they bite, right? So the goal at, on a proof of concept is not to make the most robust script you've ever made. It is to put a put one together that, that will operate uh, uh, while someone's watching, right? Um, you know, you want to do it quickly and you want to, you want to show them bang for buck. Um, you can, you can go back if they want bang for buck and good error handling and uh, things like that and make that part of a, an actual um, engagement. Uh, some of the things that make RPA software in particular appealing over a scripting language uh, is things like a credential vault where, so we know that if I have to log into 10 systems, I need credentials for all 10 of those systems. And all of these IT organizations are going to want a secure way to manage that. Um, one idea I had was using something like a SQLite database and some basic encryption to uh, and a, a web-based interface to uh, uh, store uh, credentials, and then you could use your script to uh, pull those out as needed uh, and use them. But uh, a credential vault, uh, a way to audit who ran what script uh, and when are, are the big draws to RPA software versus uh, scripting languages. Uh, the other big draw is uh, the ability for business users as opposed to programmers to utilize it in a go forward. So that's the other main point you want to go after. So you want, you've done a proof of concept. At some point, the company wants to know, how do I stand on my own? How do I move forward without you? You're expensive. Uh, most of the organizations offering this kind of service also offer to train a staff of business users to do this sort of work uh, that's specific to their business uh, and support it. Um, you know, how do, how, do I, how do I fix when things go wrong, right? That's, that's the big question. Uh, so you wanna, you wanna 
you want to think about how do you offer that the the fix when something goes wrong and ideally what we want to do is stand up something called the center of excellence to handle that where their own business users are supporting the day-to-day -day operations uh routine problems uh and uh maybe even designing a few new scripts along the way uh so that that's the complete picture of what you're wanting to offer then on then and only then you've sold them on that picture do you bring technology into the equation Okay, can I back you up just a little bit? Yep, I said a when lot. <laughs> uh, when your phone rings, the guy on the other end, is he asking you what is RPA and what can I do? Or does he have an idea of what he wants to do? Or are you actually kind of presenting this? Tell me how you so go. 99% of the time, they haven't got a clue what RPA is. You have to explain it to them. You have to say, look, uh, what I can offer you is the ability to uh, software to take care of mundane processes like data entry from spreadsheets for or moving data from one system to multiple others. Uh, that's what I can offer you, uh, and you can you can reduce staff accordingly uh, for that. You have to explain to them that. At some point, you're going to have to bring up that it is automation, desktop automation. Uh, the conversation will inevitably end up involving a CTO who's going to want to ask details like how do we manage credentials and, uh, you know, and audit trails. Uh, Maintenance, security. Basic security questions, right? Sure. sure. Uh, basic IT know, management. So as soon as you say automation and their, their CTOs, their, their red lights are going to go off and they're going to be like, look, I know 100 guys that can write VBA macros. And the problem is, is that, uh, you know, that we don't have any way of managing credentials and it's not secure, right? It's, it's a never ending battle. So you have to have a way to manage that uh, that will satisfy their, their sense of paranoia. Because uh, the last thing you want is credentials that can be used for automation and that uh, maybe their uh, monitoring uh, allows high volume of traffic. The last thing you want is for them to be thinking about ways for that to be compromised. Uh, and there are ways to do it, but we're going to, you know, it's going to take some inv inventing and, um, you know, the thing that most people don't realize is that uh, the Automation Anywheres and Blue Prisms that are out there uh, were originally layers on top of AutoIt. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not this is not a big stretch for AutoHotKey to go there as well. Uh, but you're typically beginning your talk with IT people, not with business people. Is that right? No, you start your talk with business people, okay? Because the first sale, the first part of the sale has to be money. They're only going to listen to money. They don't right. care. They just don't care. You, you've got to start this conversation about That's money. Right. Then they're going to bring in yeah. the IT people to talk about the how. Okay. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. So this, the, the initial pitch is always going to be business people. And, it's, and you're going to have to explain a lot. You're going to need to be able to educate them, you know, this is, this is what we can do for you. And you start there and you let them drag you into the specifics, right? Just keep it high level, let them drag you into the specifics. So you say, I can, uh, I can provide you with some software that can uh, take these jobs where we, are, where we uh, take data from one system to another or from spreadsheets into multiple other systems, or maybe from multiple systems into spreadsheets for reporting, uh, things like that. Uh, I can take all of the people that are doing those off the board for you, right? Uh, I can save you and it'll, it'll cost about, you know, whatever your business model ends up being. Uh, so we'll use $10,000 a year because that's what it generally costs. It'll cost $10,000 in license fees and $2,000 a day in, uh, uh, in development time. Uh, and then they're going to go development time. Well, what's that mean? And, so you say, well, usually there's a 
you know, two, three month engagement. And uh, what we do is we automate the desktop process for you on their desktop. And then they're going to go, let me bring my CTO in. Right. That's going to be the order of things. Right. All right. Sounds pretty typical. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that'll be the order of things. And, and, and you want to let them ask questions because the more questions they're asking, the more interested they are. Okay. You want to, you want to bait them into becoming engaged in the conversation. Part of my idea when I was looking at the opportunity here uh, before your input was that because of some of the IT issues, I wondered whether or not medium-sized companies might be better because they're far more pressed on the bottom line and they're not as highly structured in the IT area. But it sounds like to me you're really dealing with Fortune 100 companies, people with strong IT. Well. And there's probably a couple factors that at least, right? One is, because I was thinking about, you, you need to have quite a few people doing that process in order to, you know, to automate it, to make it, to really see the gain, right? You're replacing five people at the 80,000 a year instead of just one person, right? Which helps on average. Um, and then um, just the overall budget, right? Which, which that's a, it's a big price tag. Yeah. So, so you got to think, all right, so a typical engagement, uh, start to finish all right you're you're going to spend they're going to spend a million bucks uh you got to think about the types of organizations that can afford to do that um which is again why we see insurance and banking so common in this because uh, they have these big companies they have that kind of money to spend on a project to reduce costs now that is not to say there is not a market in in the small to medium-sized organizations uh, and, and you've also got to consider that we're talking about licensed software in my case, all right? So we're not talking about free open source software like what we're talking about here. Uh, in, in so, so there's a difference in cost overall that can't be under, understated here. Uh, you're looking at providing something that is a free open source software with a different so overall support model. So, so let's, let's automation anywhere, Blue Prism, WorkFusion, UiPath. Uh, they offer elevated support, uh, e- even when you have a partnership with them and you do your own support. They offer elevated support to these companies that do this RPA work uh, that are partnered with them uh, for the things that they just can't solve. What is, what is your support model with auto hotkey? Well, go to the forum, right? <laughs> uh, or, or you're going to have to stand up some sort of a, a system for that. It's going to cost you money, and that's where the license fees come in. Uh, no, I would not recommend doing it for free open source licensing. I, you're going you're gonna to burn yourself financially with the support. Uh, but come up with some model that appeals to... Uh, and, and, and by the way, those costs, the $10,000 is per bot. So if they want to set up three automations, that's $30,000 just in license fees. And that's per year that these companies are expe- expecting to, to spend. So and it's, uh, it makes sense, right? It saves them a ton of money. So yeah, yeah, and so they're willing to spend it because they have the money to spend, and because it saves them money, uh, they're willing to take the risk, uh, and that's why you start with a proof of concept. Yes, right. I can actually show up on your site uh, and and deliver you a an automation that does what I said it does. It's not perfect, uh, but it, it proves out the concept for you. Now, now you have proof that what I've said will happen. Uh, let's talk about the actual work. This is where you get into the two to three month engagement, how many, pro- we want to assess business processes and see what is automatable and what's not, uh, what, what is rules based, what's, what's not. Uh, uh, Tank? Yeah. You, you mentioned license fees. So there, there's, there are license fees for the automation software itself. Yes. Then also for your own work, your work yes. is paid by license. So yearly. So if your robot works for five years without requiring any work from you you get the so repeating license, fees, uh, license. yeah okay. license fees are, are uh in fact so, most, of these, most of these uh, uh rpa softwares will shut down if the license isn't renewed 
okay, but you have you two two licenses. The one one for the 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 platform, if you wish. No, no, one no, for no your the work. license is for the platform. Uh -huh. License is for that platform, and um, and. Uh, but, but your work, are you paid for what you do? And you're then paid for for labor for for work performed. Um, yes. That's okay. Separate. Your your work is not under the license model. Your work is paid for the number of hours you worked. Yes. Okay. In fact, we bill our hours uh, directly, so. Uh, on it, they, they expect to see eight hours of billable hours uh, per workday uh, in a typical engagement. Sometimes there's reasons for it to be less. Maybe you were traveling that day. Um, but they're, they're paying a, a flat fee for your presence to be working on this every day yeah. until it's done, until it's signed off and tested. Um, they're going to usually want some want some uh, artifacts generated, you know, some some design documentation and, and things like that that add a little time to the, to the overall development. I mean, each of us could probably sit down and take a process and start banging out code uh, in, in reasonable fashion and, and be done in, in one period of time. But uh, you need to think about that they want some documentation for their IT staff, some design documentation, some documentation around what to do when things go wrong. Uh, generated and, and those are things that you're going to add to your your workload um, but you expect the line of business the the business itself to do the testing you, you want them to test it out and say yes or no this this passes you know at least as well as as the current manual process uh, because that sign off is what releases you from having from any more work on it and and moving on to the next project uh, and that's where the support model picks up. So whatever support model you come up with that you're paying for it with license fees, right? Whatever support model you pick up uh, takes over from the day that they say, yes, this is good, it's passed. Uh, and, and that's where those costs are incurred. Uh, now, if we went, if we went, you know, and went to an organization, I see here the uh, profile decision makers uh, section here. If we went to a, an organization and said, look, we're using a scripting language to do all of these things. And yeah, we figured out a way to do a credential vault of some kind and, uh, you know, uh, way so that your, your um, governance people can enter credentials that the developers and users never see or you can touch. Uh, Let's say we, we've crossed all those bridges. Here's an auto trail for you. Uh, those kind of governance questions that they always want. Uh, your, the next question is, is how computer literate do they need to be? Well, if we're talking about auto hotkey, uh, we all know that we, we at auto hotkey profess to be for non programmers, right? But what's the reality? It helps, right? It makes Absolutely. a big difference. No. Uh, so we don't want to go and say, look, you know, you don't need to know anything. We want to give them a, a realistic, it's good if somebody's got some scripting. I don't care if it's JavaScript, right? Uh, we want them to have something. Uh, unless you're going to come up with some sort of GUI-driven solution uh, to, to generate your automations. Uh, and again, I cannot stop referring to Pullover's Macro Creator in that regard because it is a it is a very uh, very good starting point for for where you would want to go with that. Uh, and it's been a while since I looked at it, but that that is exactly the kind of thing that the business user is looking for. They want to be able to just click here and maybe answer a couple of questions, and and pow, we have an automation, right? Uh, didn't write any code, didn't didn't save a file, you know, nothing like that. Tank, you mentioned about uh, travel and working on site. Can part of this work can be done remotely from your so own At office? some point, you're going to know enough about the process, uh, and maybe the company has given you remote access, right? You can't do an automation without access to the systems. Can't be done. Trust me, I've been there. Can't be done. Uh, 
uh, you can be the smartest guy in the world and it's not going to happen. So you have to have access to, the, access to the systems. At some point, you'll know enough about the process to where uh, being able to put your hand on Jan's shoulder and ask her questions all the time is not going to be part of your daily routine, right? Uh, I, I've written a paper about the value of a SME in, in the automation effort and having a subject matter, matter expert is critical. But at some point, you will know enough to where that's not a daily part of the process. You can get by with an occasional email back and forth. Uh, and in that regard, so that's where we're at in a current project right now. I'm working from home primarily. Um, but you should be prepared. Uh, if, if, if this is to be a business model, you should be prepared to, to find yourself in situations where you've got to be there uh, four or five days a week, every, every week uh, for the entire engagement. That, that's, that's a reality that, that you need to be prepared for. And that's why it's expensive to do this work because there are travel costs. And uh, if they can't afford a couple thousand dollars a day for a consultant and, and expenses, they probably can't afford to do this anyway. Uh, or at least they're, they're not thinking about the money right. So you want that commitment. Uh, and, and so you've got to be prepared for it because for a good portion of the startup of any project, you're going to need to be able to have a lot of direct communication, a lot of show and tell, things that you can do through technology, but it doesn't work as well. Just does, doesn't. Yeah, is it to... to to be discussed with head office or sometimes branches will have their own needs or what are, what is your experience? So it depends on uh, is this, is IT is often very centralized. So, so it depends on where the work is getting done. So let's say you, you, uh, let's say you did a, a banking industry, but the work is done at branches. Uh, that is up to them to determine where, where best to, uh, site you. Chances are, though, you're going to find that these are going to be in corporate offices somewhere, the work that they're going to be looking to get automated. Uh, once you've explained to them what RPA is and what it can do, they're going to have ideas. They're going to get together and they're going to have ideas about what, what should or shouldn't be done. And then from there, you've got to pick out the things that are rules-based or where Jane has to make a gut decision on a regular basis. Well, I can't automate that. I can't do gut decisions in automation. Uh, I can no, do Design I can do things that, where there are rules, um, and there have to be rules. I don't care how complex it is, but there have to be rules. And uh, so, it depends on where the work is done. That's where you're going to be. That's where you're going to spend your time. Um, yeah, and there I, are rules, uh, and there are exceptions. So, yeah, and, and so how you, do you fight against exceptions? You don't. You don't. Okay, so there are, uh, in, in every automation I've ever done, there has been a, these are the things that we are not going to automate that are part of this process, these edge cases, these things that are abnormal, uh, that require a human being to get involved in. Uh, so we're going to have an exception process, and it's going to kick them out and, and to be worked manually. Okay, so that's part of your design effort when you do your design work and you generate those artifacts is who handles exceptions? What is the process for that? Uh, will it get generated into a file? Do they, what is the process? So, yeah. you know, typically we just generate them into a, a, a spreadsheet of some kind and, and say, you know, look, these need to be worked uh, by a human being. Uh, and they represent the small percentage of, of the overall workload usually. Uh, but you don't you don't fight the exception. Uh, the exceptions are part of the automation process, and uh, so you end up, you start out. Uh, I think the last big one that I did at Bank of America started out with 30 associates doing uh, a task. Uh, ended up being one just handling the exceptions. Okay. So you don't fight the exceptions, you embrace them, and you come up with a process to, to deal with it. Uh, and they're, they're necessary evils to, to every automation. But when you say, look, we're going to have exceptions, and uh, the, business that the business users say, this is how many we generate per day, and one person can handle that, uh, versus 10, 20, 30, 
that's still a save for them. They're still looking at the same money overall that they were looking at when they started this with your proof of concept, right? That's not that's not going to dissuade them. I guarantee it. I've never I've never heard of anyone going, well, because there are exceptions, we're not going to do it. It's never happened, and, I, and I've done it for a while. Um, exceptions are necessary. Uh, I think that's, I think more or less I've covered most of the main points of this page. Cool. Have, have I or have I not? No, I think so. Uh, oh, yours businesses are newer likely. It really doesn't seem to matter. Other than, I guess, unless you're, I guess, in technology, most newer companies are small. I'm, you know, they're just not as big. Yeah, uh, but you can have new conglomerations that were multiple companies joined together and, and form mm -hmm. a new company. Uh, but it doesn't really seem to matter how old they are. They can be new. They can be old. They can. It really depends on um, if they are at least mature enough to be thinking about cost and savings. Well, and I, and I think also your point earlier about you're talking to executives. So at, at Texas Instruments, where I used to work, um, they, their their IT stuff is for the most part, they were very old in their approach of things, right? But if it's not IT driving it, right, that negates that whole thing. You have a champion that'll push it, then, then that takes care of it. But, you know, I guess that's a good point. Let's talk about the things that IT is concerned about. So security credentials, audit trails. The other thing that seems to come up a lot is, uh, is this gonna be a rogue IT shop? So, <laughs> With most RPA software, you say, no, we just need business users. It's not IT people. With mm -hmm. AutoHotKey, you might say, I need IT people, uh, which brings into different salary ranges for, for folks that they may employ doing it uh, for a center of excellence, mm -hmm. uh, different cost benefit analysis. But the bottom line is, that's that's the big question. That's the, the other big question is, is this gonna be a rogue, unmanaged by IT shop doing this going forward once you people are gone. Um, and, uh, and so that's where it comes into play of, of what kind of interface you provide for them to do their own automations. Mm -hmm. oh, that's like a last chunk. Um, cool. All right, let's, and then unless someone else has on that, um, we can, I think you actually talk to a lot of these as well, um, and maybe not directly, but they get answered by the feedback you've already given us. Um, I don't think there's a minimum job size. Uh, I have, uh, well, I have I think, seen and and worked on scripts that were one day jobs. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and, and that would also they're usually part of they're usually part of multiple automations getting done. Mm -hmm. But it, but you know you 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 have different different specific processes that you're automating, and I have seen processes that were as small as one day tasks from yeah. start to finish. Uh, so I don't really feel like there's a minimum job size. And remember, they're paid by the day. They're not paying by the job. Yeah. Um, and, and whatever license model is established. So as far as minimum job size goes, they're going to go, I can spend $10,000 on a license and $2,000 in a day. And I'm, as a business, now I have to evaluate, is that worth it to me for, for the savings I'm going to get? If that one day job, saves them two salaries the answer is yes yeah right it's hell yes yeah uh, are you um thank are you asked for an estimate of the effort effort that will be required to do the job so and is it, is it easy to of course you have experience so it's easy for you to to well, estimate no, it, the effort. it's not easy it's one of the most uh difficult parts of the job um so, so it's never easy so you, you, there's a stage where i've done my proof of concept uh, and we've decided we want to move forward and do a real engagement. So now I want to go through all of your suggested processes to automate uh, and pick out the ones that are truly automatable and size them. Uh, so there's this stage we call assessment where we go through and assess business processes uh, for automatability and, uh, and for size. And, and it's at this stage, after we've agreed to do more work, we've got a statement of work, we've got a contract saying we want more work done, 
and we're agreeing to pay you for your time, right? So every day I'm doing an assessment, I'm getting paid. We're still collecting our fees. Uh, we want to assess our business processes and figure out what's what and how long it's going to take. And that's the stage where you do that. And then you go back to them. There's at that stage, you're on one statement of work as, as the actual engagement will be. Um, but at that point you go back and you say, okay, well, you've got this one process that will save you uh, five full time, right? But it's going to take me a year. They may go well. Never mind. Yeah. On that particular process, right? So, so there's this this uh, engagement. They may you may say I've got this one that's going to take me three months. Uh, that I think is going to take me three months, uh, based on its its complexity, and uh, it's going to save you four full times. Uh, and they go, yeah, that's that still sounds like a good deal. Let's add that process to the to the list of work that we're going to do. Uh, so you're gonna, you never, I've never heard of a situation where you assess one process, you assess a bunch. You're not yeah. getting into this for one for a one hit wonder. This is not Tone Loke and uh, Funky Cole Medina here. <laughs> That was, and that was actually, I was wondering, is like, do you, do you, does your, well, not your company, but um, it sounds like just in general, the first idea, you get your foot in the door, you get them to, you, like you said, go on site, even show them, dazzle them with something really quickly to show them, look, we can, this can be done, right? It's, it yeah. is real. It can happen. It's just a matter of, are you, is the pricing right? Right? Does it make sense? Um, but yeah, it's doing so, that first one. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, uh, that assessment is really where you, pick out which automations will and won't uh -huh. uh, see fruition. Um, so you, you've eliminated ones that can't be automated at this stage, at the assessment stage. You said, look, I'm rejecting these because I can't automate these. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to the business and you say, all right, here's the ones I can automate based on the amount of time that it's going to take mm -hmm. and the cost you're going to incur for that and how much you're going to save. Which ones do you want me to move forward with? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and do you often find roadblocks that prevent you to do what was assessed as feasible? Okay. So during the assessment, you want to make sure that's a great question. Uh, and what I forgot to bring up during the assessment, you want to make sure you document system accesses that are required. Um, because this is the most common roadblock where you go to start doing an automation, but you don't have access to the system. Okay, uh, you want to doc you want to you want to document your your system access and you want to say, look, I will start the work as soon as these requirements are met. Right. So there may be a break between assessment and work starting because IT has to get their ducks in a row. Uh, but you're you're still on this one statement of work for this engagement. Uh, so then you go through and and. Uh, they, they get your system accesses set up. They, they may allocate you a, a laptop to work from where that's controlled by them. Uh, a lot of times you'll find that they'll do their own background checks on you. Uh, uh, before authorizing access, they may, uh, they may even require compliance trainings from you uh, sure, as, yeah. as part of getting access to one of their assets, right? Uh, for, for Clients reasons. So, but once their ducks are in a row, once they have your the, the things that you've documented as requirements for you to be able to actually work, right? I need I need access to, to this credit card system. I need access to this uh, uh, billing system. I need access to this uh, uh, customer records, whatever it may be. I need credentials for it, for both for me and the bot that, that I'm automating, right? Uh, we need these credentials configured in a UAT system if possible, a, a, a uh, non-production system if possible. You are going to find uh, tight ropes that you have to walk where you occasionally run into a system where there is production only. And this may be a, a vendor, uh, they're dealing with an outside vendor for this product. Uh, and they don't have a, a test system to get to provide. Uh, it could be that um, this system just never had a working UAT uh, available. Uh, 
uh, and I have seen both. Uh, what, what is UAT, please? Uh, user acceptance testing environment. So, so there's a, most IT organizations will have like a, a, a development environment. Then there's the, uh, an environment above that where you push for, I've got a release, it's past all of our development process. Uh, I want to have the users test it out and make sure that they don't find problems. So that's the UAT environment. Uh, typically with automation, we work directly in a UAT environment. Uh, because we're not, we don't need a dev environment for an application. We need a non-production environment to test our automation against. Right. We want to be able to enter records into this uh, billing system without it actually billing anyone. We want to be able to uh, process credit cards without credit cards actually changing, moving money, right? Things like I, that. I sent out an email to I think around 400,000 people at TI once because we didn't have any sort of testing environment. And yeah. I was demonstrating, look, this can be done. And sure it can. <laughs> yeah. So. So these are the things you're going to ask for, and you're going to, you know, you're going to expect them to promote to production. You do not want to be involved in promoting anything to a production environment. No. Uh, you want a UAT system that mirrors. You want to, so that's part of your requirements, right? You want a UAT UAT system that uh, version of applications that mirror production. Uh, maybe not necessarily with the data that's in them, but in functionality, right? It needs to be as close to production as possible. You need credentials. You need credentials for a bot, or at least one bot or more, depending on what you're doing. Uh, and, uh, and and so yeah, so so that's you just think about it. Anytime you go somewhere, anytime you've ever written any automation, there are things that you needed that didn't involve the code or development environment that you needed in order to be able to do that automation. Those are things that you want to document as requirements and say, look, IT, I need you to provide these things for me. Tell me how, you know, and that may be in the form of a work asset, a physical asset, or it may be VPN, it may be whatever, but I need you to provide it for me. And any other kind of roadblocks uh, beside these that you mentioned? Roadblocks that can happen on on your way while you you develop or So I have found roadblocks with the associates that you're dealing with sometimes these SMEs get so nervous about their job because Im Immediately as soon as you enter the workforce with them and you're learning about their job Look these guys aren't stupid. They know they're losing their jobs right in one way or another whether it be moving on to something else and you find that people are even if they believe they're going to move into a different role in the company, right? Mm -hmm. No one likes change. No one likes change, no. especially people who have done mundane jobs every day of their lives. Okay. <laughs> so, so this ends up being a roadblock that you have to deal with. And this is a political roadblock because how do you deal with it? You don't go, you don't reassure the associate because you can't, right? right? That's not, that's not something you can do. You can't say, look, it's going to be all right. Cause it's not. It's just not, uh, you know, you, you have to be able to strategically refer them back to their manager and go back to their manager as well and say, look, uh, Jan is, uh, I don't feel like Jan has given me the kind of support I need. Right. And, and this is a, it's a difficult conversation and it's one you got to be prepared for. Right now we're under our contract, right? They're agreeing to pay me for my time. So if Jan causes a roadblock, right. they're paying for it. How long are they going to pay for that roadblock? No. Right? They're going to make Jan get off her ass. Or they're going to find somebody else. It's going to happen. Uh, they're not going to let Jan get away with being a roadblock too long. Uh, I have run into SMEs that sabotage processes. Uh, that will give you bad instruction uh, on how a process is supposed to be done. Uh, so I would say always verify every step. Uh, test it as soon as you can, the step manually. Make sure that it, it works the way it's described. Uh, and, uh, and never take anything for granted when it comes to the actual automation work. So that I would say that's the other big roadblock that you are, are likely to run into as the people. Now, sometimes you find, uh, 
and in fact, I've been rather lucky. I, I have found that you have SMEs that know they're going to be part of the go forward process and they're excited about it. Plus they kind of like the magic of watching magic happen on the screen. Right. Yeah. Uh, do, do, um, and I, maybe it's covered something that's just with getting the credentials, that kind of stuff, but do you have it being a roadblock at times? If you cannot sell them that you have a good way to manage credentials and audit trails, uh -huh. You're, you're going to run into roadblocks with them. You're going to run in. Now, usually, the other roadblocks you run into with IT get squashed by executives who are after money. So, hmm. you're going to have IT saying, I don't want to give you access to this, that, or another. And the right. business is going to go, fuck off. It's ours. Yeah. With my French. Yeah. But yeah. Money, yeah. money walks and bullshit talks, right? I mean, that you don't have a valid excuse. No. Uh, so I don't, also, I don't really consider those because those get squashed quickly. Uh, the, the legs that they get to stand on are, are on credential management and audit trail. Got to have that in place, a, a system in place for that that satisfies them and, and, uh, and a way for them to uh, manage issues, uh, whether no matter what that is, whether it's Issues are going to be reported through a ticket and escalated to you somehow, whatever that model is. But those are those are the things that you run into with IT, and they're 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 things that you overcome at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a. It's important to draw a distinction between objections that they would have pre-sale and roadblocks that they may throw up as the engagement proceeds. Yeah, the the roadblocks. Uh, where you run into roadblocks is where they go, you, you've come back, you've got a new statement of work for, for an engagement, right? And they don't want to give you access to something. Uh, exactly. But, but you've already endured the company compliance training. You've already got sign off. The business has invested money in this now. Uh, they've seen a proof of concept. They've seen that real money can be saved. Uh, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear what IT has to say about why they don't want to give access. They just don't. Um, I, I've never, I've never seen a case where that that ended up growing legs and and taking off. I'm not saying it can't, but I've never seen one yet. Um, and just generally speaking, is I think you said this before, but um, you're not um, comp companies in general that are doing this. They're not out there actually pushing it. It sounds like right that, that there's enough people out there looking for it. That's summary. Well, so so there are uh, there are uh, conferences and things like that where the the initial contact is usually made. There are. Um, just general uh, pitch decks that are delivered to companies that no. but typically we find that most of these come from referrals. So mm -hmm. Black and Decker maybe had some automation work done and uh, the two CEOs play golf together with no. No. right. And so they said, Hey, this is and maybe they're unrelated industries. So they're not feeling like there's a competitive advantage. Right. With cost. Uh, so, they say, well, this is what we did, and uh, we'll give me their number, and I'll see what they have to offer, right? So so we see a lot of referral business. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of conference-driven business, and uh, and sometimes just some plain old-fashioned legwork, door knocking. Here's a here's a pitch. Yeah, and, right? and obviously a lot of repeat business, right? Once you do yeah it. yeah. So once you've done one, right? Once that once they realize results. Yeah. Uh, we find that we see a lot of repeat business. Uh, I can't tell you how often when I was doing automation work at Bank of America with AutoHotKey, uh, how often a line of business would come back and go, hey, you know, we didn't talk about this before, but, and I stayed, I stayed busy for the better part of eight years just doing things that hadn't been thought of yet. Yeah. In, in same lines of business. And um, so there's, once they see work done, once they see work done, they see the magic, 
they see the results, financial results, uh, they start thinking. And maybe these are things they didn't think about when they were putting together things for you to assess. But they start thinking. They start thinking about changing job processes so that the reasons why this process wasn't automatable before goes away. All right? Now, a lot of people will tell you, I don't want to automate a process that isn't mature. I have always found that a bad practice. Uh, there are a lot of RPA firms that will not do a, a process that is not mature. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of good reasons for it. However, I find it's a, I have always found it's a good practice to go, okay, so you've got this spreadsheet where you're entering data. Where does this spreadsheet come from? Comes nine times out of 10, it was copied and pasted out of some other system or systems, yeah. Yeah. right? By some other department. That's part of their routine work. Well, let me just go to the source, right? I, I, I want to change this process altogether and just eliminate the two processes and make them one. Yeah. Um, these are... It's, and a lot of a lot of RPA uh, firms will will tell you we want the process as it is today because it's proven. Uh, and I would tell you uh, that I disagree with that firmly, and say that you should always think about the process and think about ways that with yeah. a little change it can be done better. Yeah, I I always I always was uh, in school. I was the Socrates of I question everything, right? Of like, well, why do you do it that way? Where did the, where did that? I mean, it's amazing the stuff that you uncover of why people do things that way they, they have no idea, right? I don't, they don't know. They're just like, this is what someone taught me. It's the way I do yeah. it. Yeah, and, and in fact, you're gonna run into that a lot. You, they don't know why they always click this checkbox. They don't know uh, why they pull this data out of this one screen of this system and then generate a spreadsheet with a bunch of records from it and then go back into the same system but a different screen and key all that data back in. <laughs> they have no idea. Yeah. yeah, and I've seen it. Yeah. So uh, it it is it is it is never frowned upon to ask questions. Uh, I ask questions. I ask stupid questions. I, I I like to pretend that I like to start every engagement with it with the SME as I want you to pretend I'm five and explain it to me. Yeah. I can't insult my stupidity by dumbing it down too much. Yeah. Uh, because if you can make me understand it, I can think about it logically and think about ways to do it a little better and a little quicker. Skip a step here, uh, bridge two steps together here, whatever. Um, so there are school, like I said, there's two schools of thought. Improve a process or do it as is. Most of the big firms are saying do it as is. I disagree with that firmly. I have a lot of experience doing process improvement as part of an automation uh, and I've rarely had it turn into a problem uh, I won't say never I, I've had one that turned into a problem but because I didn't ask good questions um, Joe I don't know how much more time we have but I'm I would like to hear you talk about the tools and what you would recommend for, for me to learn a new tool and say that's the first one you should look at. And it, do I have to buy a license it, to learn the tool or do they facilitate the learning from third party developers? So the two primary tools out there, Blue Prism and Automation Anywhere, will require you to buy a license. They're $10,000 a piece. You don't want to go that route. Okay, um, the first one is, what's the name of the first one? Blue Prism. Blue Prism. Blue Prism. Blue. I got all these notes down. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest picking up Work Fusion uh, or UiPath. Uh, they each do things a little differently, but you're going to get the idea. So essentially, they're like database systems. They all have to have a certain core set of features and you just have to figure out how they implement those. Yeah, there's a core set of features that, and, and really what it boils down to is for the things that I can automate, uh, how do I take the coding effort away 
and make it so someone's filling in some text boxes, right? That, it, that's essentially, so like Blue Prism, all of the, all of the script design is done with a, a flowchart model. So you literally drag and drop shapes and then fill in text, fill in boxes for, for details, maybe a variable value or uh, uh, details for an if condition. But it's Formats. drag and drop flow charting. For automation anywhere, it's uh, drag and drop toolboxes like you would in Visual Studio with uh, toolbox objects onto the screen and it applies it as code uh, and you fill in some boxes. How do I make this so that someone who doesn't need to know the code behind a message box but can, can put you clarify a message box? Something here, Tank, because it sounds like overall you guys develop um, an, you know, a program for them to use, right? For the end user that doesn't, they understand, they don't have to know coding at all. But it gets back to it's the, the, the upkeep then, that's why you want to have it into something like that where the, they, they, can, they can tweak it? Because you're saying you want to avoid taking it out of the hands where they see any sort of programming, but the general user is not going to be doing any programming, right? They're gonna, all right, so back to what I was saying with they're going to think of things that they didn't think of originally. They're going to have support needs. Uh, the system that you were wrote code wrote a an automation for changes, right? They're going to have okay. upkeep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is where we talk about setting up a center of excellence so that they can support themselves. Maintenance. Okay. okay. Uh, they're going to think of new things to automate that maybe don't rise to the level of paying for a consultant, right? Gotcha. Uh, so. So they need to know how to use it, and this is why. They need to be able to figure out what's going on. Um, and, and this is this seems to be the primary driver for why we see automation anywhere, Blue Prism, Work Fusion, uh, UI Path in this market, as opposed to scripting languages. Because mm -hmm. I think we can all agree: you give me AutoIt or Auto Hotkey, and I can do far more with it than I can with some limited set of features from this tool. And you can. It's absolutely true. But that is less important than an end user being able to understand what's going on and maybe adapt it. So it is the end user that, okay, that's where I was getting thrown. I thought you would, because I meant, I know you mentioned earlier you, you'll spend some time training people a bit about the actual you know thing. But I still thought it was going to be, okay, there's the one geeky guy right that that you train him to do it and it will be a geeky guy yeah. but because they have to be able to think like a programmer they yeah. have to be able to think in terms of well this process that is uh you know uh billing is actually this step this step this step this decision this step this decision this step repeated several times yeah. they have to be able to think that way so yeah. it will be the geeky guy okay. however He's not a programmer. Still, an IT organization that they have to learn a language. They think, "Oh, I've got to pay an IT salary. I've got to yeah. pay." Uh, yeah. Right. There's a whole there's a whole list of things. Where do they get training yeah. and certified for it? You know, there, there's a whole bunch of cans of worms that come with it. So that so the sale, you're presenting something that you don't need. That you need some smart guy in your department. Gotcha. And sometimes you need to go to the code behind the, the UI? No, you never go to the code behind never. the UI. Okay. Uh, because the UI is the tool itself uh, and, and interprets it. And, and, um, and I say that because there isn't a way to do it in some of these tools. Huh. But you, you don't want to do it. No, it's not even a matter of not wanting yes. to. There isn't a way. They, so what they do is they generate a pseudo code script that is actually interpreted at a high level that yeah. you couldn't edit if you had to because if you do, it, it invalidates some checksum wow. in the text file and, uh, and, and it breaks it. Hmm. Tank, I'm going to push back a little bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll straighten me out. Part of my background, actually, I'll go back and give, give you some, it, it sounds so familiar. Back in the 90s, I was on the front edge with Lotus over Lotus Notes. And we ended up in a lot of the same situations we're in now, an emerging technology. Nobody understands what it's used for. You have to explain 
explain to everybody what it does before you can explain, you know, how you can help them. So I get a lot of what you're dealing with here and have dealt with that. But one thing clients would always say, you know, it was so easy to develop applications. And we would talk about that with notes. Anybody can do it. It's like building a spreadsheet. And they, clients would often say, yeah, 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 we want to do that. Yeah, yeah, we do. And you paid lip service to it. But in reality, they still had you write everything. They still had you change every last little detail. And in fact, what's that, the reality the there for? And, and in fact, you, you're going to find that that's the case sometimes. However, if you ask me to come back and uh, change a system, right? That's not support. That's new development work. If you ask me to come back and because we can talk about things that aren't working as designed, right? That's support. We can talk about, uh, but but when we talk about, I need I need some things updated because we're changing some process, right? That's more development work. You're going to pay me my daily fee. You're going to you're going to sign a new contract with me. Uh, we're going to have to assess this process, even though we know how it's going to turn out, 99% of the time. Uh, and you're going to pay me to come on site, right? So this is an investment when we talk about this. You're providing them a way not to have to do that, even though a lot of times they're going to do it anyway. That was my question. What's your what's your sense about how important it really is that some end user can really do something? How often does that actually happen? So whether or not uh, whether or not you uh, get brought back to work on previous engagements to to do more uh, to more changes or, or things like that. Uh, it's almost like you're selling them a sense of security, a sense of a security blanket. Sure. Right? When, when you offer to stand up a center of excellence for them. So they can, they know that they can rely on, on Jan to, to work on their, their stuff uh, if need be. Uh, they prefer to call you back. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's what I expected. Uh, but they, but they like, they like thinking they can do it themselves. Yeah. That's my experience with IT in general. Yeah, they, they like thinking they can do it by themselves, and they may even try a few times. And really, what it does is it, it ends up reaffirming your expertise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, or, or you get lucky, and and uh, the person that you trained to uh, support the product is actually pretty good at figuring things out and, uh, and and they pick it up. But one of those two things will happen uh, and you won't have any control over it. Uh, but by selling them the idea of a center of excellence to support their own product uh, and only needing to escalate to you when things truly necessitate it, uh, you're, you're providing them the sense of a security blanket. Sure. Uh, I'll, I will tell you that the reality is, is when we find somebody who does that, we usually hire them. <laughs> Steal them from the client. Well, so that's part of your company. So you're not going to poach, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so th these are all things that come in as part of your initial agreements. Uh, Tank, I don't want to be too cu curious, but do you work on your own, or do you work for a company that is selling I, your well, services? I work or for one of the large companies that do this, I'm not. I'm not uh, bashful about it. I work for a company called ISG. Uh, so, so let's uh, let's uh, let's talk about the companies that are that are providing this as a service, real quick. You've got Accenture, you've got ISG, you've got Genpack, you've got probably a couple hundred other startups, right? Uh, you've got uh, uh, Cap Gemini doing it now as well. Uh, big firms, global organizations. Uh, the other thing that you find in common with all of these is that these guys were involved in advising on outsourcing. So they go straight from a, a, a business model of outsourcing, which is finding its sunset. It, it is slowing down. Right, this business model doesn't work anymore, especially in Trump politics. Right, foreigners bad. Um, so you find it incredibly appealing to uh, 
unappealing to to outsource work uh, to bring in H one B visas and and, um, and and things like this. So, so this business model that most of these big organizations, these big global advising firms, uh, have been involved in, is slowing. It's waning. Uh, so, how do they stay in that same market? Well, they go and say, look, we can say, and the, the appeal of outsourcing is what? Reduce costs for labor, hopefully increase quality if it is, is a selling point. With software and no human beings, I'm decreasing cost and increasing quality. So, so it's the same selling points. And uh, so it's a natural transition for them to, to start from where they were and, and start moving into this RPA world. Um, some are dabbling in cognitive automation as part of it. Uh, some are not. Um, we don't do cognitive automation yet. We're, we don't feel like we have a good candidate for, for the kinds of uh, work that we'd have to do. There's uh, one thing that comes with cognitive automation that uh, is unavoidable is big data. Um, and you're going to find that most of the places just don't have the data backup data to support the training process for a cognitive bot. Uh, and when I say training, I mean, you want to teach them how to parse this invoice, teach about how to process, parse this invoice, you may need a million examples. Yeah. Literally a million examples to train that process, that bot to recognize the data you're looking for properly. Um, and they just don't have it, right? So it, it, it's a limitation set about by the, the amount of data that places have for, for cognitive automation. Uh, the technology works, uh, but it's just not very common. And so there are companies that are dabbling in it and there are companies that are not. Our company does not. Uh, mostly because there isn't a good use case for it. There's not a good general use case for it yet. And because we can get around most of it with other other solutions. Um, anyway, I forgot where I was going with all that. <laughs> My background's in big data and multivariate statistics, by the way. And um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Most most companies just don't have the data to support it. Yeah. Or the know how. Right. And so even if you hire a firm with the know-how, they just don't have the data for it. And Cool. Um, and I mean, if you got to go or anyone has to go for that matter, right, feel free. But um, this has been very educational. Well, I mean, I, I can give you a little more time here, but uh, just I think we're kind of to a Q&A stage anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Do you, um, you, you mentioned, I mean, I think often it comes up where you're, you're basically, my experience is I'm, I'm transferring data from one system to another more often than not is where something like this comes in incredibly helpful. Yeah, it's, it's an easy win. So as soon as you hear that, that uh, as soon as you hear about a process like that, you're, you're, yeah. you know, your, your alarm should go off and go, yeah, that's, that's something I want to try to do here you know you have some more complex things like um, you have things like dat files right with just a almost an i and i format uh, of data and, and depending on those data elements it may go to one system or another that becomes what i would consider to be a pretty complex process <clears throat> but uh so you do run into that where the data drives the, the, the input system. Uh, but more often than not, uh, you're going to find where you also have uh, a lot of cases where you have data being input into the same multiple systems or pulled from the same multiple systems into a single source. And they're paying a lot of people to do this because it's a tedious manual effort which uh, someday I hope, I mean, where I think we're getting there, where there companies are making APIs available that allow you to, you know, programmatically grab and interact with it easily. And that's, that was one that I, I did a lot. Um, my other jobs were I could, instead of using a web interface to go look at my data and get it, I could hit it with an API call. And it was awesome. 
Yeah, so most RPA software, because remember we're thinking about non-programmers, is not written to do that. Sure, yeah. Uh, whereas that's an advantage to something like AutoHotKey where I don't care how I got to get to it. Yeah. I'm just going to get to it. And uh, so it's one of my big complaints about RPA software is that uh, it's very limited in what you can and can't do. That's what I was talking about when I said user interactions, custom user interactions. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. You're not going to generate a GUI and let them pick something. You know, there, there are some things in a, in a process that would be great for automation, if only for that one part where you need a user. Yeah. And, and we're really very limited with RPA software where that one user for that one step needs to come mm -hmm. into play, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, it's really frustrating uh, for someone like me who's used AutoHotKey for eight years uh, to do everything to go, but I can't do it now, right? Yeah. The whole process is a wash because I can't do that one step. And uh, so it, it's uh, it's very frustrating. Um, you're, you're really, when you talk about conventional RPA software, you're really talking about primarily unattended processes. No user needs to be there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anyone else have anything? That I was think, good. I think for me. Good. good. Good for me. Thank you, Tank. Yeah. Uh, Very you'll useful. think of things as, as things come. Just shoot me an email. Cool. Um, now that we're done with this, I mean, do you do you care if I make this a public video? I don't think we discussed anything that was. I, I don't. I don't think uh, we've talked about anything proprietary. Yeah. Uh, I, I try to make it a point not to talk about things that are proprietary unless uh, unless I know it's fine. Yeah. I, I know I mentioned Bank of America a few times, but that was an actual employer, and I wasn't. You didn't go into any sort I of wasn't detail. Confined by anything there. Yeah. Um, so okay, well, no, I, I, I mean. I was just thinking other people might find it interesting, right? The discussion, but um, I'm I'm also fine keeping it unlisted and just sending the link to, to basically us. I, I don't care. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you know, Joe, you, you kind of have a reputation of trying to both further the brand and uh, uh, publish useful information. So I kind of always expected that this was going to be such a call. <laughs> Yeah, that which is that, and that was this next slide, which, like I said, we can talk to if we want or not. But um, it amazes me that just the lack of people's adoption rate of I don't I like Auto Hotkey because one as I know it well and it seems easy to use, but whatever, right? Just it's amazing. Even programmers, I will show stuff that just using hot strings to to better write your code. In so, you, I, I want to stop you right there. So yeah. I was at uh, Codapalooza in uh, Louisville uh, about a year ago. And I was watching a presenter uh, using the, uh, what was it? The, the thing for the Xbox that tracks your movement. Uh, oh, Connect. Yeah. Connect, yes. So he was demonstrating how to write code for it. And I'm watching him touch his keyboard and code appear on the screen. Yeah. At some point he minimized the screen, I see the big green H. <laughs> and uh, so, th so this was an example of, of somebody in 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 this world, right? Using it, and and so it's a dirty little secret. It's a dirty little secret amongst the IT world because, come to find out, just about everybody at his firm used it for yeah. things just like that. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I use Auto Hotkey. We're doing a, a project right now where we're doing code conversion, VBA code to, uh, to, for design. So we're, we're taking it and turning it into a flowchart, right? Well, the flowchart has to go in as plain English, right? So I wrote some regex patterns to take what I, the recognizable parts of some VBA code and reword it as plain English, meaning the same thing. Uh, Save me an incredible amount of time having to retype every every time I come across the same kind of statement, right? Uh, and, and so I'm using automation to generate my automation. Yeah, this is my friend that um he didn't make it. And it, it's it's 
you're going to find actually, if you talk to uh, enough people out there, that it's a dirty little secret. They're using auto or auto hotkey more than we think. Uh, GoDaddy, in particular, uses auto hotkey. Yep, to deploy uh, new accounts for hosting. Interesting. Huh. I found this out whenever I had a hosting problem way back when we were still hosting with GoDaddy. Uh, and I called them and I was like, you know, this is a pretty important site. And we're, they're like, we know. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's a dirty little secret and nobody talks about it. That's funny. So, um, we, we, and there is a demand for automation. They just don't know it. So that's why you start with the conversation being about money and then you get them yeah. to automation. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and it was making me laugh really when you said there's some of those people who've, who they fear the SMEs fear basically having, you know, to, to stop, to actually use their brain, right? They're, they're so used to doing this mundane task that they just know frontwards and backwards, but it's easy and I, I can go home and, and, like, you know, yeah, they might actually have to do something where they have to think, imagine. Yeah, and and you, you'll find most of the articles about the robots are coming or some variation of that. Yeah. It talks about that that's where the job security is going to come, is in people who have to think for a living. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm sorry, it just, it reminded me of, I read one of your, one of your posts on LinkedIn, or I think it was an article actually, whatever, but it, I think it's something, was titled something like, Rethink, repeat, something close yeah, to that. Rethink, so that's right. repeatable. And, and that repeatable, that's what it is. And then I thought that did a good job of, because that's one of those things a lot of people just don't get of like, well, what can be automated, right? And, and it's a good short summary of what do you do yeah, over and over? Yeah, it's easy for somebody to grasp the idea of typing some data in somewhere, somewhere repeatedly. It's not an easy thing for people to grasp the idea of things like, uh, Research tasks, for yeah. instance. Yeah. Uh, it's not an easy thing for people to think about automation in terms of uh, data fetching. Uh, and, and, uh, and there's a lot of room for it. So uh, usually people haven't thought about the reports they generate in Excel, right? They'll, they'll, they'll compile data into Excel and, and generate a pivot chart. And, yeah. And then spend time to make it pretty every time. Right? And they don't think about automating all that data gathering. Yeah. And the amount of time that can save. Yeah. Um, at, at, at a job, a guy used to spend 40 hours out of a month working on the reports. And he would manually do all that stuff. And I got it down to literally, it was a script I would run that would take about six minutes to run. But, I, of course, I wasn't doing anything. And, and, it, and it did so much more, right? It was just like... And it was easy. Um, it, it's it's just amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. But, yeah. I uh, I did this. This is a story you can share. Since uh, I did this in a call center, right? Data fetching, right? There's not much I can automate doing for them in a call center. But in the call center, they have to look up account details in multiple systems uh -huh. uh, on on every call, right? So I created a, a common user interface. Uh, with all the data points that they could ever need on 99% of all use cases. Uh, and every time they get a new call, I would detect the screen, screen pop and automatically generate that data on one screen form. They didn't have to spend literally an average of a minute and a half pulling that, yeah. you know, small talking the client while they pull it on right. so they can see what's going on. Right. And, uh, so we saved an average of a minute per call. Uh, across 300 associates, we saw three quarters of a million dollars in saves. Now, the side effect, the unspoken, yeah. non-obvious benefit no. came from, since we had an audit trail from multiple oh. systems, all now in one place that we could query, yeah. what we had was a way to generate first call resolution metrics. Nice. Yeah. Right? So, we could generate, why are people calling back repeatedly? Why are, right. where are we succeeding? Where are we failing? Where are training opportunities? Where are we seeing a lot of calls from uh, generated by sales that we could fix, we could head off ahead of time? So, so the un, the unexpected 
yeah. benefit came in reduced call volume. Uh, it's estimated that in reducing call volume, they saved another million dollars over the next three years. Wow. Just in that unexpected, you yeah. know, having data that they didn't have. And so that's, that's something, you know, you got to talk about. We've but, got, you can't track everything users can do, but I can track everything an automation does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And have a good log of it. But what I always thought you were going to go to say is the um, being is one of those people that call in. Right. And I have uh, on average, it's a, my call is a minute less of my time. Right. Customer satisfaction, I'm sure to some degree gets improved. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that's certainly a, a benefit, but uh, yeah, it's not. There's, there's, there's measurable, me, real yeah. measurable uh, financial gains to be had. Yeah. Um, and I guess I didn't really bring it up, but, but the ability to track every action of a robot yeah. versus the ability to track the, all of the effort of your best SME. Oh, it's, it's uh, yeah. and, and you mentioned big data it generates some big data for you to work with right. for analysis that you never had before. And there's no telling what will come of that data. That data will generate yeah. ideas and thoughts and solutions that you never dreamt of. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm, it's, it's a, I'm just realizing, I'm looking at this list here, I'm going to add it somewhere in there of, like, you don't realize the other side benefits that you weren't even thinking of, right? When you went to automate something, is yeah. now you have a log file or a, some way to track um, and, and, like you said, find your typical things that are coming up or identify best practices or fix the training in yeah, the first you, place that's out in the field, whatever, right? It's, we didn't realize that, you know, it was a common complaint uh, on the floor. We didn't realize how much time was being wasted setting up terminals that the sales rep was supposed to deliver already set up. And, and in fact, the setup process was broken uh, and we didn't, and it wasn't measurable, right? So it was a complaint that you'd hear, but you can't measure it. So you can't react to it. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden we find that 7% of all the calls are poorly set up and deployed terminals, right? What do you do? You've solved that problem. You don't fix it in the call center. But right. now you have a measurable result that it's costing this many dollars. Yeah. Right? It, it makes a big difference. Well, uh, I don't know where else we can go with this. I think we're good. Maybe, I mean, if, if anyone's interested, maybe in a, let's say even a month, um, if we want to, uh, or it's just a webinar topic we could do, but I was thinking what might be a fun one is to to put out um, requests, but have people talk through some of the the best use cases of either AutoHotKey or any automation that they did and how it saved people money, right? Just well, to, even, even back at Bank of America, it was money. Yeah. It, it took money to sell it. Yeah. It took money to sell it, and um, the guy who drove that project was a Six Sigma black belt. Uh, they were very against it, uh, but the Six Sigma black belt presented them problem, and uh, with Six Sigma methodology, a solution that was unrefutable, right? This will generate real savings, real money, uh, with an established methodology of, of – of making that statement that is difficult to refute. Uh, they had to go for it. They didn't have a choice. The money was on the table. Um, and that's how auto hockey got started at Bank of America. Uh, I had never heard of it before. I had been doing some VBA macros for them. Uh -huh. uh, and this was back in uh, 2007. And uh, no one ever dreamt uh, I had macros that saved multiple, multiple billions, millions of dollars uh, a year uh, in fraud analysis that used to be a human effort that was imperfect and impractical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, do you have any knowledge? Did they, do they have someone else still working with it? Did it die? Well, they've eliminated some systems. Uh, they do still have somebody working with it. Uh, there, there was eventually a team of us. One of the guys is still there. Uh, cool. The current organization, um, this is an instance of a mature organization. So, so there's been some uh, business changeover of hands. Uh, the merchant services organization is run by another outfit now uh, due to a, a merger of operations, uh, joint venture. And... Uh, 
they are uh, they're a mature organization that does not see rational thinking. <laughs> they are they they are constantly working on undoing. Yeah, it was one of the reasons why I left them. It's it's sad how often I think that actually is true. Um, yeah, I finally just gave up and quit. I mean, I couldn't handle it anymore. It, it yep. just so that's why that's why I say maturity of an organization doesn't really matter. It matters how well they have their ducks together and how much they're focused on uh, cost savings. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, for now let's wrap this up. Like I said, maybe we'll have another chat where we can talk through some other stuff if you're interested or whoever is. But um, great stuff. I, I I've been making Sounds a lot. Good. Of notes. I've been making yeah. a lot of notes. I'm going to send them around to everybody. Um, so. Um, if anyone has anything to add to them, that's great. But um, as soon as it'll take like, I think like an hour for this video to be done. So when that's done, I'll, I'll send out the email with everything. Awesome. Good. Thanks again. Tank, thank, thank you. Thank you, very you much. Tank. Thank you You're very much. Thank you very much. Really Bye. appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you.